So it's about general philosophies, f general philosophies, you see the plural, of science and economics. Uh, and uh, the outline is this, I've quick, uh, some literature, then an introduction, and then I'm discussing different positions in this general philosophy of science. And one of these positions is inductivism, positivism, falsificationism or deductivism, that's the philosophy of Karl Popper, then paradigm theory, the philosophy of Thomas Kuhn, and finally uh, on orientational paradigms, and we'll discuss these positions and the connection with economics, what did he do to economics, was it accepted, was it not accepted, what happened there. Uh, the uh, basic idea is uh, that if, if you uh, visited a class on philosophy of economics, you should know these names, these fundamental and fundamental positions, uh, because they come up in discussions um, now and then. And um, if you said, yeah, I was at the University of Zurich, I was in a philosophy class, but I have no idea who Karl Popper is, then people would say this was a very strange class which it may still be anyway, but anyway. Okay, so all literature is supplementary. There's, of course, tons of literature. You can walk for hours in the library across philosophy of science. Uh, so I'm just giving you a few things, uh, suggestions, if you are interested in it. So in general philosophy of science, there is a, a fairly good textbook from Chalmers, what is, the things, what is this thing called science? And there, the chapters that are relevant here are 1, 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9. You are allowed to read the other chapters as well. So I'm not for, forbidding this, right? Just that you don't misunderstand me. And then a book of mine, if you want to read something about Thomas Kuhn's philosophy, another book of mine, if you want to read something about what is later coming in systematicity theory, uh, there is more literature. And then there's another um, uh, re rather, well, recent also, eight years old, of, uh, introduction to the philosophy of science. And there's the chapter one, two, five, and six. And then this is now gen has been general philosophy of science with no special emphasis or relation to f uh, economics. And here is special literature for the relationship to economics. So there's a fairly um, well-known uh, paper, Back Roger Backhouse, or rather a chapter, The Rise and Fall of Popper and Lakatosh in Economics. So there seems to have been a sort of career of Popper and Lakatosh in economics. And that was a period of something like 20 years when these things were heavily discussed in economics. Well, heavily, I mean, comparatively to now. Um, but uh, now uh, these things are not really uh, anywhere. They pop up from time to time but not uh, in important um, uh, positions. Then Blauk is, a, uh, is an older paper, Kuhn versus Lakatosh, or Paradigms versus Research Programs in the History of Economics, um, a book uh, by Latsis, who was a pupil of one of these guys here, Lakatosh, Method and Appraisal in Economics. Then uh, this is a, a short book, but that is quite good if you want to see something about the connection between general philosophy of science and economics. Methodology and economics, a critical introduction, is already 30 years old. Um, Anyway, Robbins, then I mentioned this already, I think, on Lassie's method and appraisal in economics. Um, also a, a well-known paper. And then a book, What's Wrong with Economics, 50 years old. I don't know whether there's still something wrong with economics, according to Ward, but uh, you may read that. Okay, so I just... Now I come to the introduction to this general um, philosophies of science. Some of you will know something. Some of you won't know anything about general philosophy of science, and therefore... Uh, some points uh, by way of introduction here. First of all, again, like in the parts when I talked about the history of economics, this is all simplified, right? I can't do more than simplified for any of these positions you can hold a full semester class uh, and, and, and the discussion about it. So the positions will be simplified. And as I said already in the first lecture, as everything else in philosophy, these positions are highly controversial and they partially contradict each other. So they can't all be true, right? They're highly controversial in various respects. Um, the positions in general philosophy of science come in two four main forms, and that is now important uh, also because it touches upon a topic I will come back to very soon again. There are some positions who understand themselves as articulated by the philosophers as normative positions. Normative positions in the sense that they speak about science in the sense that they say how good science should be practiced. So they articulate in norms how science should be done. So they are not looking what are the scientists doing, but they think how should, how should good science be done. And that a, there are some of these positions who just articulate how good science should be done. And these are the normative positions. 
and there are other positions who are descriptive positions, and they give some sort of philosophical description of the sciences, whatever that is. Well, in practice, it seems to be it is giving some generalized descriptions of existing science. So you speak about science in a very general way and describe what the scientists are doing and what, what, how science functions, and you get some insight, hopefully, uh, how science works, the real science. So one is normative and the other one is descriptive. Um, all right. And uh, historically, the positions we are talking about are something like um, up to 80 years old. They have been developed for the natural sciences. So these people were, all these people we're discussing here, were primarily interested in the natural sciences and there especially physics. So what many people don't know is that the other natural sciences are partly very different from physics. So if you try to understand biology and you come with a mind frame of a, of a physicist, you will in many cases not understand what's going on. It's a very different discipline. Uh, and also geology is different and chemistry is different. So these, these um, um, uh, disciplines are very different from each other. But the, the main thing was that these people, these philosophers, they knew some physics. Um, some knew a little more, but some only had undergraded physics. Um, so the question is how well did they really understand physics? Anyway, but they were developed for the natural science, especially physics. So this, of course, immediately poses the question as well, wait a minute, if that's developed for physics, will it be somehow relevant, applicable for economics? So this is not perhaps it, perhaps yes, perhaps no. Okay. So, and even there, if you just stay, stick to physics, it's controversial how well they fit to physics and all the other natural sciences. So some biologists, for instance, said, yes, this position is maybe good for physics, I can't judge it, but it certainly doesn't fit biology, because biology is different. So it's all full of controversies, and of course controversies are also extending then to the social sciences, even if they fit the natural sciences, which is controversial, it's not clear how well they fit the social sciences, and especially economics. Economics is different from the other social sciences, again, in, in uh, important respects. So it's very open when you, when you enter this uh, room full of philosophy, general philosophy of science, whether there's something useful for you as an economist or not. And we're going to discuss that. Now, that's the idea. There is massive disagreement about the appropriateness of the position for economics among economists as well. So some economists say, yes, this popper is wonderful and, you know, economics is a popper in science and should be and blah, blah, blah. And others say that's not right. And uh, so disagreement among economists, not only among the philosophers. The result is this. And that, that's important. If we find discrepancies between any of the philosophical positions and the practice of economics, it's not at all clear how to evaluate these discrepancies, right? So you read something in philosophy about uh, science and they say such and such, then you compare it with economics, say, oops, that's different here. So what do I make of this difference? And there are two, two principal possibilities. It could be that the normative or descriptive philosophical positions, depending which one you are, uh, you are uh, talking about, a descriptive position or a normative position, it could be that the normative or descriptive philosophical position is inadequate or just wrong. Or it's not applicable to the social sciences for whatever reasons. So you, then you say as an economist, okay, if that position is wrong or not applicable, I don't care. I mean, it's not my fault that the philosophical positions are wrong. That is one possibility. Of course it is one possibility. The other possibility is that, for instance, a normative philosophical position is basically correct and applicable to the social sciences, but economics does not live up to these standards. So there may be, I'm just telling you possibilities, I'm not taking sides here, I'm just telling you these are the possibilities if you have the discrepancy. It could be that the rules are okay, right? That these normative philosophy, uh, philosophical positions articulate, but that economics is just, to put it bluntly, a lousy science, you know, a dismal science that does not live up to these standards and therefore it should be improved, you know, guided by the philosophical positions. Uh, that these are just the two extreme positions. Uh, if you have two things, one normative thing or, or uh, normative or describing something general and a particular case, and if they don't coincide, you don't know where the mistake is, right? Something is wrong, but you don't have no idea where it is. And the uh, principal possibilities are, are these two. <clears throat> 
And this is a special case of a general problem that's highly relevant for economics, and I'm coming, I guess, uh, uh, again and again back to this uh, problem. It's the problem if there is a discrepancy between norms and facts. Right? And that happens everywhere in life. I give you everyday examples in a second. If there's a discrepancy between norms and facts, then either the norms or the facts can be wrong in some sense, or even both can be wrong. Right? And it's not a priori clear which one is the case. So whenever you have a discrepancy between norms and facts, right? something somewhere, a norm, wherever it comes from, and you have some facts, you see, whoops, the norms don't obey, uh, the facts don't obey the norms. It's not clear what's wrong, right? So for instance, um, well, I come here, for instance, and that's uh, immediately an example relevant for economics. That's if people behave irrationally according to some norm of rationality, say you have uh, in microeconomics, violating transitivity, right? That means uh, then economists say that's, well, that, that's irrational if you violate uh, transitivity. I come back to it. Then there are always two possibilities. You have here norms for rationality and you have behavior. And then you say, whoops, that doesn't fit, right? Then either they are indeed acting irrationally, uh, irrationality, if, if, if irrationally, that may be the case. It could, but it could also be that the norms that, that the standard of rationality are inadequate, inadequate, or the norms are misapplied. So it's not clear if someone claims, look, I'm giving you the norms for rationality. Here they are, that this person is right. It may be wrong what she's saying, right? And therefore it's not clear. It could be that the person is acting rationally and the norms are wrong. So, for instance, if you look at the most recent political debates, I saw a debate recently in which it was discussed whether Putin, you know, you may have heard the name recently, this is a guy who lives in Russia, and that Putin is ir completely mad, completely irrational with his attack on the Ukraine, and other people say, no, 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 he's behaving completely rationally. It just depends, right, how you define in that context, how you understand in this context rationality. If you understand rationality as means and, and rationality, then you may say, okay, this guy has the goal of, um, you know, subduing uh, Ukraine, and one of the possible means is really attacking it, and therefore, given this goal, it's rational. Then you may say, well, that's short-sighted. You've got to look at the side effects. What sort of side effects is this guy uh, producing? And then you may say, look, these side effects will be so horrible that it's irrational to do that because he won't succeed. Or you may even say, look, the whole goal is completely irrational. And therefore, even if the means for that goal are chosen rationally, because the goal is so irrational, the whole action is irrational. So what you see here is, that it, when you judge, evaluate a certain action as rational or irrational, you're using a certain standard. But the standard is not completely clear. It's not absolutely clear in every situation what rationality is. It may be completely unclear, and you may be a, uh, then attack the notion of rationality. And that is the very, very, very general situation that we always have when we have a clash between norms and facts that it's not clear what is wrong and what is responsible for the clash. <clears throat> so uh, you see that, of course, um, in, in many other less dramatic cases. So if you, if you imagine now uh, the, the city of Zurich would decide uh, that um, the general speed limit in Zurich is not 50 uh, and not 30, but it will be uh, uh, 4, 4 kilometers per second. Right? And then people would, of course, especially if you ride a bicycle, it's very difficult to ride a bicycle at speed four, right? And then you, you, you do eight or whatever as a minimum speed. And then you get a fine. And then you would say, wait a minute, I mean, this is really completely crazy to ask people to move in a city on a bike with speed five. It's, it's not possible. And you would immediately say, this is a completely crazy norm. Right? Because I can't obey it. It doesn't make sense. Right? And then you would say the discrepancy between the norm that the bikers do eight kilometers and not five, that's not due to the, to the failure of the, of the bikers, but the norm is stupid. Right? So this is, and this is everywhere, as, as far as I know, that because the norms are as critical or possibly false as the facts can be false in the sense of the evaluation by the norm. 
both can be the case. If someone does 100 kilometers um, in Zurich somewhere, I mean, I guess you find few people who'd say, oh, the norm to drive less than 100 in Zurich is just crazy. No, it's quite clear. Then this, this fact is that's idiotic, stupid, irrational, uh, and he, he or she should, should get a fine or, or go to prison. Um, so in that case, it's clear that the facts are then uh, the, the, the bad part, but, and the norms are probably right. So, but in principle, when you, uh, when you uh, um, uh, confront a problem of a discrepancy between norms and facts, a priori, it's open. What's the wrong partner? And in the worst case, of course, both things are wrong, right? Clearly. Okay. So that's the general introduction. That's important uh, that you have this distinction between normative and descriptive in the back of your mind, because that's also important here uh, for these general uh, uh, positions in general philosophy of science. And as I told you already earlier, and it will come up again and again, that in, especially in economics, and I'm not aware of any other science where it is so important uh, that these normative elements, they, they enter somehow the realm of the descriptive in, in somewhat or sometimes unclear manner. And one has to understand what's going on there. All right.